You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My topic for today is the minimum wage. The minimum wage is a very contentious issue among economists. Some economists, myself included, believe that the minimum wage actually reduces the opportunities for the people it is meant to help. Others, for various reasons, believe, along with most of the general public, that the minimum wage generally helps the least advantaged, low-skilled workers in society. So I'm going to go into this, and I'm going to give my take on this issue. The general public is as I mentioned, nearly uniformly in favor of the minimum wage. I think that's really just the result of a lack of careful thought on their part. There are sophisticated arguments for the minimum wage, but the sort of first-glance way of seeing it is, well, of course people should earn more money. How could you be against that? And most people just simply stop their thinking there. Daniel Kahneman, a behavioral economist, has a theory of sort of, well, a psychological theory, really, that when people are faced with a difficult question, they substitute an easier question that they know the answer to. So if I'm faced with the question of, should the minimum wage be higher? Well, that's a tough question because the minimum wage has many impacts, has a complex effect on the economy, and that might be too hard for me. I might not have the time to give it its proper thought, especially if I'm not a professional economist. So I might simply answer a different question, like, do I think that low earners or maybe poor people, if I believe that most minimum wage earners are poor, do I believe that low earners should earn more? To which I would answer yes. But of course, that is the wrong question. Some economists on this issue, on both sides of the issue, will jump immediately into empirics. They'll start discussing the latest regression analyses or surveys, They'll start discussing studies that purport to uh, attempt to use some natural experiment to measure the disemployment effects of the minimum wage. I think this is a very wrong-headed approach to the issue. I think the first answer to any question concerning economics always has to begin with sound theory. I think when people do jump right into the empirics, that it's a sign that they see theory as sort of a placeholder. We draw these supply and demand curves, not as a description of the way the world is, but just as a sort of way of deciding what variables we're going to put into our empirical analyses, and just a way of constructing theories by drawing lines on graph paper, and then having those theories just so, just until we can do some really good study, empirical study, like a physicist might do. A physicist might come up with some mathematical theory and then go out to the uh, particle accelerator or, or something and test it. And we have a great deal of respect for people who let their theories live and die by the evidence But I don't think that's an appropriate approach to economics because economics is different from physics in a number of ways. First, in physics, we don't have an intuitive answer to the questions we want to ask ourselves. So there's no obvious answer to a question like, what are the smallest building blocks of the universe? Or what are the rules governing the motion of planets, and stars. These are not questions that we as humans have an easy way of answering. But when it comes to economics, we have a unique perspective. 
we see the world from through the eyes of human beings. So when we want to study human beings, it's relevant to ask ourselves, what do we know being human beings that can help us understand the world, the world of human choice, the world of human action? And the answer, I would say, is that we know deep down and fundamentally that people behave with purpose. People observe the world in terms of means and ends. They have preferences. They have some ends that are more desired than others. And they form beliefs about the world using their senses. And when they believe that they have some control over outcomes, then they act in such a way that, according to their beliefs, will bring about a state of the world that is more preferred than the other state of the world that would have happened had they behaved differently. And that's what it means to be rational. You behave, you act within a framework of means and ends. You act according to your beliefs in such a way that you can best satisfy your ends. And that's really powerful. Anything we derive from that simple observation, if our logic is correct, anything we derive is just as true or just as certain as that very basic statement that people use means to achieve ends. Statistics, on the other hand, with respect to human action, are very difficult. It's very hard to have a controlled experiment. And if you really wanted to have a controlled experiment, it would probably be very immoral. You know, it's one thing to lock away a particle in a vacuum and observe it, but if you tried to do that to a person, they would not like it very much. But in all seriousness, the reason you can't have a controlled experiment is because people behave differently in different circumstances. And no two circumstances are exactly alike, even if they were physically exactly alike. The people's beliefs, the people's understanding of what is going around on around them, and the people's ends may be different. And we can't observe directly people's beliefs or their ends. We can only observe the means they use to achieve them. And we can only understand these means within a framework that acknowledges that they are being guided by beliefs towards the achievement of ends. So that's a basic primer on methodology. I said this episode would not be about methodology, but the minimum wage. But before I jump into discussing the minimum wage, I want to discuss a more congenial example, a less contentious one. So, we know that people behave purposively. I'm going to not start from the very beginning of a, of a simple barter economy and work my way up, because, of course, this is a limited time frame sort of medium and not a long tome. But I'm going to assume now that a labor market exists, an economy exists, and I'm going to consider a business, a firm. Maybe it sells sandwiches. And this business, in order to produce sandwiches, it has a building, it has to pay rents on it. It has some equipment, tables, knives, and it has to buy the factors of production uh, aside from the tables and knives and building needed to make sandwiches. So bread, lettuce, meats, you name it. And one of those factors of production is human labor. It needs to rent labor from people who have other ends, who would like to be doing something else with their time. They have a scarce resource called time. And in order to get some of their time and their effort in the form of labor, they need to be compensated. So the business pays these people a wage to make sandwiches. 
if it offered a wage too low, these people would do something else with their time. If it offered a wage that was very high, business would attract very skilled sandwich makers. It would have a lot of sandwich makers banging on its door, potential sandwich makers. But the business would not be viable because in order to pay those very high wages, they would have to sell very expensive sandwiches. And there are other businesses that also make sandwiches, and those businesses can offer the same product for less. So the business needs to offer a wage such that it can attract the workers it needs to produce sandwiches, and it won't offer more than that because if it did, it would lose money. The owners of the business would lose on their investment. So given this sandwich business, now let's say that something happens elsewhere in the economy. Let's say the sandwich business is in Alberta, and elsewhere in Alberta, somebody strikes oil. Now, the oil industry requires many things. One among those things is labor. So, with the news of this oil, there is suddenly a large demand for labor. Labor of all kinds, skilled, unskilled. Even if you don't know how to weld or work on an oil rig in some technical capacity, you can clean the rooms of the people who work in that technical capacity. And this oil industry can afford to pay you very highly, even for a job that takes little skill, because oil is a very highly valued commodity. And so what the oil industry does is it posts job openings. And people who people from all over look at their current earnings and look at the what is being offered in this industry and even accounting for maybe the unpleasantness of the job, many of them will determine that they would rather quit their jobs and go work in the oil sands. Now, back to the sandwich business. This is a competitive industry. There's no barrier to entry, and so there are many competing sandwich businesses. And the entrepreneur running our particular sandwich business, he sees a return, usually, that is right around the interest return on the capital invested in his business. Sometimes it's a little more, sometimes it's a little less. Uh, if he made a particularly wise entrepreneurial decision, like maybe being the first sandwich maker to offer gluten-free bread when that whole fad happened, then he could earn an entrepreneurial return higher than the simply the return to the capital invested, and of course the return to his own labor. But entrepreneurial returns like that have a tendency to be competed away. They're not permanent, where there are no barriers to entry. And so this is a business with slim margins. The margin, the difference between the selling price of sandwiches and the prices, the costs of all the factors of production needed to go into them, is just enough to earn close to zero economic profits. Uh, there's a distinction between economic profits and accounting profits. Economic profits do not take into account the return on capital, the interest, but accounting profits do. And so they, they would say, well, I made such and such an amount of profit, when what you really did was make just the same amount that you could earn from a from simply buy, buying bonds or making making a loan and because it took time to earn that profit and because people have a a positive time preference it's actually the profit in the later time period is actually worth only what the inputs in the earlier time period were worth given that the profit is only valuable later, and the inputs were valuable earlier. So, our sandwich entrepreneur sees that some of his employees want to go work in the oil sands. Some of them say, 
goodbye. I'm leaving. I'm, I see an opportunity and I'm taking it. And the others say, well, you got to offer us more because we, we're thinking of taking up that offer too. And the sandwich entrepreneur will realize that, well, he needs, he needs sandwich makers of varying skills and he can't produce anything without them and he can't have them have their services if he doesn't pay them more. So he's going to have to raise the wages he pays to sandwich makers. And if that were the only change that happened, then it would be very bad for him. He would start to lose money. So he's going to have to, at this higher cost of making sandwiches, he's going to have to produce less sandwiches. He's going to have to only produce so many sandwiches as he can profitably sell. So if there is a if there's a technique, if there's if producing more sandwiches, you know, that last sandwich is more costly than uh the other sandwiches, he's going to reduce his output. Maybe he stops running his sandwich shop on Sundays. Maybe he used to run it week round, but now he only runs it Monday to Saturday. But, of course, all the other sandwich makers are feeling the same pressure. And so they, too, are going to be pressed to economize. They need to pay their laborers more. They need to economize more on what labor they have. And they're going to reduce their output. So sandwich lovers, in the face of this smaller supply of sandwiches, well, they're going to have to be willing to pay more. Because if you just charge the same price as you did before for sandwiches, then lots of people who kind of like sandwiches would still go for their daily sandwich. But people who really like sandwiches, they have to be willing to pay more to outbid those other sandwich consumers so that they can secure their sandwiches. And people who maybe didn't like sandwiches so much, the marginal sandwich consumers we call them, they can eat something else. And so you have this increase in prices of sandwiches that somewhat but not entirely mitigates uh, the increase in costs to the sandwich maker. And so output is generally less, but the sandwiches are sold for more and it's going to adjust in such a way People are going to reduce their output. Some firms may actually close down. And the sandwich market is going to adjust such that it uses less labor, less of this labor that is being uh, siphoned off to go work in oil. But the rate of profit, which I said before in the earlier case was simply the return on the capital invested and on the business owner's labor, that's the accounting profit, it'll go back to the point where it is a zero rate of economic profit or a or simply a return on the capital invested and the owner's labor. So what you have then is a general shift. Our sandwich maker first responded by reducing output and but now in this sort of new state of affairs as as things are heading towards a new uh, zero profit, long run condition. He's also going to start thinking about changing his techniques of production. So reducing output is one thing. Maybe there's a yeah he can reduce not produce on the least productive day of the week. I said, or maybe he can produce in such a way that each sandwich maker gets more table space so they can each be more productive, even though there's fewer of them working. But the other thing he can do is start to change the methods he uses. So now he's looking at his balance sheet. And before, maybe the large, largest element of cost was the rent on his place and the rent on capital goods that he has to use in the creation of sandwiches. But now his, a higher portion of his cost than before are the labor services of his employees. And so he's looking around for other ways of producing sandwiches 
that use relatively maybe more, maybe he uses more space, more land, uh, you know, expands into the business ne- next door, or he uses a different sort of technology. Maybe instead of having workers slicing bread with knives, he has a bread slicing machine. That is, the machine is more costly, but it requires less labor to use it. And so he's going to change the technological uh, composition of his business such that he is using less labor, because of course that was a big part of his expenditures, and more capital goods, because they were a relatively smaller part of his expenditures after the increase in the cost of labor. So after this initial shift towards businesses simply producing less and and trying to just use the best methods that they could use given the capital goods they had already invested in, our sandwich entrepreneur and his competitors are going to shift into different technologies that economize on the now more scarce factor of production, which is the labor of sandwich makers. And so you have this short-run change, to use the language of neoclassical economics, where the capital invested is relatively fixed, and the entrepreneur simply changes the amount of output in order to use the capital he has in a in a less costly way, or rather to reduce his costs in terms of labor. But then there's a longer run change where the form of his business may change. And this long run change doesn't have to be within the firm. It could actually end up being a change in which firms, which sort of firms. So maybe you had a lot of sandwich shops run by humans, but maybe now you're just going to have a sandwich vending machine that just has a guy come around every week. Oh, sandwiches might go bad in a week. Every couple days to refill it and uses very little labor and focuses on the capital good side of things. But that adjustment takes time and is not automatic. People need to look around them. Entrepreneurs need to look around them, observe the state of the world, uh, see that costs are, labor costs are higher, and find ways, find new productive ways of combining capital and labor to make sandwiches that economize on labor and maybe economize a little less on capital. And the ones that are slow to do that, the ones that fail and to adjust uh, quickly, the ones that continue to use labor-intensive processes, even though they now have to pay quite a bit more for labor, they're going to experience losses, while the ones that adjust quickly and are more alert are going to earn profits. And there will be through, ultimately, if these entrepreneurs fail to adjust, if they are just so slow, if they just can't figure out what they should now be doing with the new state of prices, it's ultimately bankruptcy that will force the adjustment to happen from the less efficient producers to the more efficient producers. But that bankruptcy doesn't have to occur if the producers, if the entrepreneurs are are wise and have good foresight, and they can all make the adjustment. But we can't say with certainty whether they will or how fast they will, only that the process leads them to. So that that's how an industry like the sandwich industry can adjust to a change, an exogenous change in the price of labor. And in this case, the change came from a new industry, the oil sands. But what I hope you realize in listening to that is that the oil sands were not important in that story. They didn't serve any more purpose than to create a scenario where that entrepreneur is looking at his books and seeing that his labor costs are higher than they were before, that each worker is demanding a wage that is higher than the wage he had to pay him previously. If he were in that exact same scenario of looking at his books and seeing these higher wages, for any other reason, for instance, if a meteor struck the earth and killed a whole bunch of people and there just weren't well maybe that's a bad example because of course it would also be killing consumers 
But let's say there was a sandwich maker convention and a meteor struck it, then the cost of hiring sandwich makers would be quite a bit higher. And it doesn't matter also if the people demanding the higher wages are doing so because of a law that says that they must not accept any wage below $10 or some amount. And our entrepreneur is faced with the same problem. How do I reduce my costs? Now, my costs with this sudden increase in the cost of labor, if I run my business the same way I've always run it, I will earn losses. I need to change things. I need to first reduce my output, try try to uh, s- slim the size of my business and and whatever was the sort of most costly, marginal, uh, productive process I was using, I need to I need to cut back on that because it's no longer economical. And then eventually, I need to change my the productive processes I use. I need to use a different combination of of capital goods and labor, such that this more costly factor is a less important part of my business. And if it's a law that makes that factor more costly, it's exactly the same process. Exactly the same. Entrepreneurs go through the same, they receive the signal that this good is more costly, although it is not more scarce, and they go through the same process of trying to reduce their use of it. And those who don't reduce their use of it earn losses and go out of business eventually if they don't adapt. And the only difference is that instead of going off to a bigger, better job at the oil sands, the people who lose their jobs or who are employed for fewer hours, when the cost increases, they simply go into unemployment. They go to a less preferred use of their time. Now, people who oppose the minimum wage sometimes get into trouble by drawing, they'll draw a supply and demand diagram, and then a horizontal line where the wage is set above where it would be otherwise, and and say that this illustrates how a, setting a price floor above the equilibrium wage creates a shortage, or rather a surplus of, of labor services, people wanting to supply their labor who can't. The problem with that is that there are a lot of assumptions cooked into your basic supply and demand diagram. There's the assumption that the goods being traded are viewed as identical by all the sellers and buyers. And when you draw a horizontal line representing the price, you are saying that there's in some sense a centralized market where no one would uh, pay more than the going rate or less. Um, And so there's an equilibrium price that everyone pays. In reality, labor, low-skilled labor, is not a single homogenous quantity. It's not a homogenous good. And what is being traded is actually many different goods. So maybe there are uh, junior sandwich makers and senior sandwich makers who have different levels of productivity and and demand different wages. One's a little more experienced than the other. And then, of course, in terms of the the contract, if the contract is to work in an unpleasant location versus a contract to work in a more pleasant location, those are different, too. If the contract includes benefits, that's different to both employer and employee. And so there are actually many different markets. If you really wanted to illustrate them through supply and demand curves, you'd have to draw a different supply and demand curve for each of these different kinds of labor, each of these different kinds of labor contract. And so, and also, the, there's no central market in labor. Uh, Searching for a job and accepting it, or, or looking around for an employee and hiring them, that's an entrepreneurial decision. Uh, and it's guided by the employers' and employees' beliefs about the other opportunities out there. And there's no guarantee that uh, the that every person providing equivalent labor services is going to earn exactly the same wage. And there's no automatic mechanism when a when a you know someone like the oil sands comes along. Some some employees might just not have got the memo, and uh, if the 
if nobody got the memo, then it wouldn't actually have any effect on, on the wage because there's no central market, there's no complete information. So this the the increase in wages when, when there's a new competitor is is a sort of a long run phenomenon. It needs to be this new uh buyer of labor has to be perceived and understood and people need to say, Hey, I'm I'm gonna go work for this guy because he's offering more and and the entrepreneurs in the in the uh existing industries need to recognize the the new competition and offer a, a better price or, or better benefits uh, to their employees to get them to stay. Um, but the what I think is really important for this sort of discussion is that the minimum wage is a price floor on a an entire class of transactions. So, you know, maybe, yeah, so the junior sandwich makers and the senior sandwich makers, let's say without a minimum wage, they would earn $3 an hour and $9 an hour, respectively. And now the minimum wage is set at 10. You could actually see more senior sandwich makers being hired. And that's because, yes, they've had a wage floor set above where their equilibrium wage would be. And that alone, if it were only applied to them, would tend to cause their, their labor to be more costly and then, then to be economized on. But they are also a substitute for junior sandwich makers. And while their labor has been increased, while senior sandwich makers' labor has been increased in cost by $1, junior sandwich makers have seen their labor increase in cost by 7 And junior, And so one way of economizing is to reduce your hiring of junior sandwich makers and hire more and employ more senior sandwich makers. So the substitution from junior to senior sandwich makers could actually swamp the the other effect of of the fact that senior sandwich makers have been made more costly. So there's that. There's all there's a substitution. You could even have a scenario where uh, certain classes of workers are quite a bit better off. They're paid more and they're in high, greater demand after the institution of a minimum wage, but it's always at the cost of the of the other workers who are uh, who are their competition, who have been priced out of the market even worse than they have. The other element is, of course, benefits. Um, I think in a pure free market, a lot of benefits that we see today provided by employers we wouldn't see. The example in the United States is uh, health insurance. It came out of the wage controls of the Second World War. Government said, you can't pay more than this. And so businesses started offering health benefits to get around the wage control. And then the health benefits were granted a, a tax uh, tax relief. And now everybody gets their health benefits in the United States through their employer. And it's actually a very big problem because people... Uh, if you're sick and you want to change jobs, well, too bad because you'd have to go off your health insurance. And it would never have been a problem if you had just bought your health insurance yourself and not through your employer, but it's so much cheaper through your employer because of the tax benefits. But in any case, a benefit offered by an employer to an employee is simply just an, another kind of exchange where there's where there are gains from trade to be had, where the cost of providing the benefit to the employer, uh, the cost to the employer of providing the benefit is lower than the uh, value to the employee of, of receiving it. Then, then both gain from the the offering of the benefit, the extension of it, and this can be simple things like comfortable chairs in the workplace, or on the job training, or things like that, and. Of course, a job with comfortable chairs versus a job with uncomfortable chairs. That's an example of some time when, a time when you'd have to draw two different supply and demand diagrams if you really wanted to be uh, complete. And so by one thing our, our sandwich maker can do, our sandwich on, entrepreneur, is to, if he's been offering comfortable chairs or other benefits, he can now not offer those. He has to pay more in dollars. But if he and his employees forego the gains they were getting from uh, exchanging reduced wages for more comfortable working conditions, 
and from those gains from trade, if they forgo those, then he can continue to employ more employees than he would otherwise. And so this isn't an adjustment from junior sandwich makers to senior sandwich makers. It's from sandwich makers with benefits to sandwich makers without benefits. So because the minimum wage is such a applies to so many different labor markets, so many distinct and heterogeneous labor markets, people of varying skills, people with different contracts, different benefit packages, different different everything, minimum wage just comes and sort of carpet bombs them all and says, okay, if, it, if the wage paid per hour is between this value, zero, and this other value, maybe ten dollars, then it's illegal. The law sees no value in any such contract. We are simply without any sort of understanding of the, the facts on the ground or the individual problems faced by each individual business and each individual employee who are all transacting for mutual gain. We're just going to come along and make the whole swath of them illegal. There are interactions between these different labor markets, these distinct types of labor, these distinct types of contract. And so you have, for one thing, a shift from from lower skilled to higher skilled. Uh, you might even see some people enter the labor market. You know, someone who sees the higher wage might come in and uh, supplant someone who is less skilled than them, but got a a greater sort of return, a, a greater placed a greater value on on employment. So I, I kind of imagine like college student wondering, should I take a summer job or or should I go surfing all summer? And you know, new new immigrant uh, who maybe doesn't know English and so is limited in what sort of job they can do, but really needs the job so that they can earn a little money and start to learn some English. And you could have a scenario where the wage is higher. So the college student who valued surfing, you know, higher than the old wage, but lower than the new wage, decides to enter the labor force. And the entrepreneur who hires him uh, prefers his labor services to the immigrants. And they now have the same cost uh, because of this wage floor. And so the immigrant is unemployed when he would have been employed. The college student is employed when he would have been unemployed. Some economist comes along and measures the disemployment and and sees, oh, well, you know, one guy was employed before, one guy's employed now, no change. But it's a different guy. It's someone who would have been perfectly happy to go off surfing, who is now voluntarily employed. And he's better off, certainly, but it's another guy who really needed the job, who is now involuntarily unemployed by the law. And that change, that shift of employment from one sort of person to another is not captured in your measure of the general disemployment effects of the minimum wage. In any case, you might believe maybe that these businesses can all just increase their prices. It could. It is a logical possibility that all the businesses could continue on chugging along with exactly the same labor force, the exactly the same contracts, paying their workers more, and simply charging more for their product. And that is a logical possibility. And then, and that's what's called passing on the cost to consumers. Although that's not really what's happening. What's really happening is this, this process where entrepreneurs look at their, uh, their books and they they start to they think okay how can i reduce output and you know how can i economize on this more costly factor of production and then the costs uh then they produce less and the and the consumers who who really want the product now have to pay more to get it to secure it ahead of uh ahead of the other consumers who don't want it so much and in this case it turns out that um all of the consumers actually really want the product and they all just pay more for it, and and then the businesses now, with the higher price of, of their outputs, actually just continue to chug along hiring the same number of people. 
is very implausible because, of course, it also presumes that they, with the different sort of relative costs, that they won't find a way to alter the combination of factors such that they can still economize on labor. But that's that's the idea of passing on to consumers. And, of course, when you pass things on to consumers like that, it makes them worse off. And many of those consumers are the same people who you're trying to make better off. I don't put much stock in, in the idea of a perfectly inelastic demand for low-skilled labor, although it can seem like that. And this is where, in the empirical literature, it's important to know the difference between significance in the ordinary, sort of, everyday meaning of the term. Like, you might say that my... uh, my spouse is a significant part of my life, or uh, my my home is a significant part of my budget. You're saying it's large and important. But the idea of statistical significance is simply that it is different from zero within a reasonable degree of certainty, usually 95%, g- given that the random distribution we think outcomes are coming from and given the the variance of that distribution, we can say with 95% certainty that this number is not zero. That's that's what we mean when we say something is statistically significant. Or it might not be zero. We might say a statistically significant difference from some number. And all we're saying is that, you know, if you flip a coin and you get 50 heads in a row, we're saying, you know, that probably isn't a balanced coin that has a 50-50 chance of being heads or tails. Those 50 heads in a row were pretty unlikely. We're going to say that with a certainty of above, we, we want to know whether that coin is, is rigged, and 50 heads in a row are very, very, very unlikely on a not-rigged coin, so we're going to say it's statistically significantly different from a unrigged coin. And the issue here is that well, that's that's all well and good. If you have a lot of noise, some things that that is if you if the random distribution sort of that that uh you're drawing these outcomes from in your in your statistical model is has a very high variance. You're going to have things that are statistically insignificant, but that might actually be significant in a sort of human perspective. And if there's anything that is a very noisy data set, it's the labor markets. The many buying people buying and selling labor under changing conditions every day. That is, uh, not buying and selling their labor, renting it out. And there are just so many factors. My entire theoretical exposition earlier was based on a crucial assumption, and that is satirist paribus, all else equal. If In the scenarios I illustrated, all else was equal until, in the first scenario, there was an oil boom, and in the second scenario, there was a minimum wage law. That one thing changed, and I was able to illustrate what else changed in response. But of course, when an oil boom happens, many other things happen. Maybe there's an oil boom and an increase in the minimum wage simultaneously. Maybe there's a change in weather. Maybe consumers demand a different bundle of goods. All sorts of things are always changing all the time. Productive technologies change. Um, and of course, then there's just that the economy as it as it grows, uh, there's a tendency towards a greater capital stock. And of course, that makes different production processes viable that may not have been before. And, and it allows people to consume things that they couldn't have afforded before. And when you're doing statistics, you don't have all else equal. You never have all else equal. And sometimes you get an answer, and you never know whether your answer is, yes, A caused B, or A didn't cause B, but all else wasn't equal, so it looked like it did. That's the key issue with statistics. The other issue, the there are some specific issues with statistics concerning the minimum wage. One is that when governments bring in minimum wage laws, they often give a 
advance notice, they say eight months from now, the minimum wage will increase. Or every six months for the next uh, 18, we will have a small increment in the minimum wage till we get to our eventual high level. And that means that entrepreneurs have the time to sort of gradually, maybe they, maybe not a single person gets fired, but they just stop, they hire less people. They don't hire to replace. They start changing the technologies that they're using in their production process in anticipation of this future change. And that, and the, so the phasing in of the minimum wage implies that people are, entrepreneurs are going to gradually change the employment rate. And if you're just measuring, well, you know, here's what it was, here's what employment was a week before the minimum wage was introduced. Here's what it was a month after or something like that. You've already missed the change that happened. It happened, you know, gradually from the time of the announcement to maybe even a little after the time that the wage was actually brought in. And you may measure zero when in fact the the effect was large. And that, of course, uh, there's another issue that when you attempt to look for a level change in a variable, when in fact you should be looking for a slope change, a slope change is what really occurred, you're also going to, you may find a statistically insignificant result. You may find that things appear not to change because you were looking, you were trying to look at the overall level of employment when, of course, it was the rate of change of employment. And and that's an issue in the empirical literature with the minimum wage. Another Another issue, a more fundamental one, is that let's say we did the best study ever and we definitively found a natural experiment and showed precisely how much an increment in the minimum wage increased unemployment, could we then generalize that? Where could we generalize it to? If the experiment was done in one country, could we generalize it to another country? If it was done in a particular year, of course it was done in a particular year, could we generalize it to the next year? And it goes back to what I said before about how... We only observe the means people use to achieve their ends according to their beliefs. But those ends can change. The beliefs can change. The way people perceive the world is not constant. And so when we, when we measure, you know, some quantitative measure of, of the effect of A on B in a particular time and place, we actually have not told that we have not learned anything about any other time and place. Those precise me- measures can't be generalized. We can maybe try to form an expectation based on the past, but there it's not a law like the amount of like a the, the gravitational pull of a single carbon isotope is is a physical law that is at least with my admittedly rudimentary understanding of physics that quantity is is fixed in some sense. But the the way a person will behave in a given scenario depends on those unobservables, their beliefs, their preferences, their understanding of the world. The advantage of explaining the effect of the minimum wage in terms of basic price theory, the same price theory we apply elsewhere to explain the, the allocation of factors of production across their various potential uses is that the theory built up from very basic observations about human nature, it tells us only what we can know. It doesn't tell us more than that. It doesn't tell us precise quantities, but it tells us directions. It says, all else equal, if A, then increase in B. And the interesting thing about the minimum wage is even though there are all these different effects... They all take a decided turn against the people it's meant to help. Well, depending on who you want to help. There are, of course, the cases of uh, people using the minimum wage deliberately as a tool of racism, specifically to hurt. I referred to it before as a carpet bombing of, of a large swath of the, the, the transactions in labor markets. Carpet bombing might be a pretty good description when it's being used, for instance, as it was used after the American Civil War to disemploy blacks, 
as it was used under apartheid in South Africa. But of course, the the modern supporters of the minimum wage support it because they think quite the opposite. They think that it actually helps the disadvantage. And what I think I hope you've got out of this is that it really does the opposite. It means the disadvantaged need to give up their benefit, which they preferred to greater pay. It means that they may be disemployed in favor of someone who's a little more skilled than they are. It means that the prices of the goods they buy are going to be higher as the economy is less productive overall with this, uh, with this factor of production being used in the, in the wrong quantities and in the, in the wrong places. It's being used at not the price that it really deserves, but at a, a higher artificial price. And so it's being treated as more scarce in the production processes than it really is. I'm Garrett Peterson. You can find me online at economicsdetective.com. If you enjoyed this episode of Economics Detective Radio, you can head over to economicsdetective.com for additional content and links. The music for this podcast was created by Cassandra McLeod, who you can find at soundcloud.com under the stage name Minaret. That's M-I-N-A space R-E-T.